Chapter 5. The Fall of Man To obey is the proper office of a rational soul. Montaigne, 2. The Christian answer to the question proposed in the last chapter is contained in the doctrine of the fall. According to that doctrine, man is now a horror to God and to himself, and a creature ill-adapted to the universe, not because God made him so, but because he has made himself so by the abuse of his free will. To my mind, this is the sole function of the doctrine. It exists to guard against two sub-Christian theories of the origin of evil. Monism, according to which God himself, being above good and evil, produces impartially the effects to which we give those two names. And dualism, according to which God produces good, while some equal and independent power produces evil. Against both these views, Christianity asserts that God is good, that he made all things good, and for the sake of their goodness, that one of the good things he made, namely the free will of rational creatures, by its very nature included the possibility of evil, and that creatures availing themselves of this possibility have become evil. Now this function, which is the only one I allow to the doctrine of the fall, must be distinguished from two other functions, which it is sometimes, perhaps, represented as performing but which I reject. In the first place, I do not think the doctrine answers the question, was it better for God to create than not to create? That is a question I have already declined. Since I believe God to be good, I am sure that, if the question has a meaning, the answer must be yes. But I doubt whether the question has any meaning, and even if it has, I am sure that the answer cannot be attained by the sort of value judgment which men can significantly make. In the second place, I do not think the doctrine of the fall can be used to show that it is just, in terms of retributive justice, to punish individuals for the faults of their remote ancestors. Some forms of doctrine seem to involve this, but I question whether any of them, as understood by its exponents, really meant it. The fathers may sometimes say that we are punished for Adam's sin, but they may much but they much more often say that we sinned in Adam. It may be impossible to find out what they meant by this, or we may decide that what they meant was erroneous, but I do not think we can dismiss their way of talking as mere idiotism. Sorry, as mere idiom. Wisely or foolishly, they believed that we were really, and not simply by legal fiction, involved in Adam's action. The attempt to formulate this belief by saying that we were in Adam in a physical sense, Adam being the first vehicle of the immortal, Im, immortal germ plasm, may be unacceptable. But it is, of course, a further question whether the belief itself is merely a confusion or a real insight into spiritual realities beyond our normal grasp. At the moment, however, this question does not arise for as I have said, I have no intention of arguing that the descent to modern man of inabilities contracted by his remote ancestors is a specimen of retributive justice. For me, it is rather a specimen of those things necessarily involved in the creation of a stable world which we considered in chapter 2. It would no doubt have been possible for God to remove by miracle the results of the first sin ever committed by a human being. But this would not have been much good unless he was prepared to remove the results of the second sin, and of the third, and so on forever. If the miracles ceased, then sooner or later we might have reached our present lamentable situation. If they did not, then a world thus continually underpropped and corrected by divine interference would have been a world in which nothing important ever depended on human choice, and in which choice itself would soon cease from the certainty that one of the apparent alternatives before you would lead to no result, and was therefore not really an alternative. As we saw, the chess player's freedom to play chess depends on the rigidity of the squares and the moves. Having isolated what I conceive to be the true import of the doctrine that man is fallen, let us now consider the doctrine in itself. 
The story in Genesis is a story full of the deepest suggestion about a magic apple of knowledge. But in the developed doctrine, the inherent magic of the apple has quite dropped out of sight, and the story is simply one of disobedience. I have the deepest respect even for pagan myths, still more for myths in Holy Scripture. I therefore do not doubt that the version which emphasizes the magic apple and brings together the trees of life and knowledge contains a deeper and subtler truth than the version which makes the apple simply and solely a pledge of obedience. But I assume that the Holy Spirit would not have allowed the latter to grow up in the church and win the assent of great doctors unless it also was true and useful as far as it went. It is this version which I am going to discuss because, though I suspect the primitive version to be far more profound, I know that I, at any rate, cannot penetrate its profundities. I am to give my readers not the best, absolutely, but the best I have. In the developed doctrine, then, it is claimed that man, as God made him, was completely good and completely happy, but that he disobeyed God and became what we now see. Many people think that this proposition has been proved false by modern science. We now know, it is said, that so far from having fallen out of a, out of a primeval state of virtue and happiness, men have slowly risen from brutality and savagery. There seems to me to be a complete confusion here. Brute and savage both belong to that unfortunate class of words which are sometimes used rhetorically as terms of reproach and sometimes scientifically as terms of description. And the pseudo-scientific argument against the fall depends on a confusion between the usages. If, by saying that man rose from brutality, you mean simply that man is physically descended from animals, I have no objection. But it does not follow that the further back you go, the more brutal, in the sense of wicked or wretched, you will find man to be. No animal has moral virtue, but it is not true that all animal behavior is of the kind one should call wicked if it were practiced by men. On the contrary, not all animals treat other creatures of their own species as badly as men treat men. Not all are as gluttonous or lecherous as we, and no animal is ambitious. Similarly, if you say that the first men were savages, meaning by this that their artifacts were few and clumsy, like those of modern savages, you may well be right. But if you mean that they were savage in the sense of being lewd, ferocious, cruel, and treacherous, you will be going beyond your evidence, and that for two reasons. In the first place, modern anthropologists and missionaries are less inclined than their fathers to endorse your unfavorable picture even of the modern savage. In the second place, you cannot argue from the artifacts of the earliest men that they were in all respects like the contemporary people who make similar artifacts. We must be on our guard here against an illusion which the study of prehistoric man seems naturally to beget. Prehistor <coughs> <clears throat> prehistoric man, because he is prehistoric, is known to us only by the material things he made, or rather, by a chance selection from among the more durable things he made. It is not the fault of archaeologists that they have no better evidence, but this penury constitutes a continual temptation to infer more than we have any right to infer, to assume that the community which made the superior artifacts was superior in all respects. Everyone can see that the assumption is false. It would lead to the conclusion that the leisured, classes, the, the leisured classes of our own time were in all respects superior to those of the Victorian age. Clearly the prehistoric men who made the worst pottery might have made the best poetry, and we should never know it. And the assumption becomes even more absurd when we are comparing prehistoric men with modern savages. The equal crudity of artifacts here tells you nothing about the intelligence or virtue of the makers. What is learned by trial and error must begin by being crude, whatever the character of the beginner. The very same pot which would prove its maker a genius if it were the first pot ever made in the world 
would prove its maker a dunce if it came after millenniums of pot-making. The whole modern estimate of primitive man is based upon that idolatry of, ar of artifacts, which is a great corporate sin of our own civilization. We forget that our prehistoric ancestors made all the useful discoveries, except that of chloroform, which have ever been made. To them we owe language, the family, clothing, the use of fire, the domestication of animals, the wheel, the ship, poetry, and agriculture. Science, then, has nothing to say for or against the doctrine of the fall. A more philosophical difficulty has been raised by the modern theologian to whom all students of the subject are most indebted. Uh, footnote N.P. Williams, The Ideas of the Fall and of Original Sin. End footnote. This writer points out that the idea of sin presupposes a law to sin against, and since it would take centuries for the herd instinct to crystallize into custom and for custom to harden into law, the first man, if there ever was a being that could be so described, could not commit the first sin. This argument assumes that virtue and the herd instinct commonly coincide, and that the first sin was essentially a social sin. But the traditional doctrine points to a sin against God, an act of disobedience, not a sin against the neighbor. And certainly, if we are to hold the doctrine of the fall in any real sense, we must look for the great sin on a deeper and more timeless level than that of social morality. This sin has been described by St. Augustine as the result of pride, of the movement whereby a creature, that is, an essentially dependent being whose principles of existence lies whose principle of existence lies not in itself but in another, tries to set up on its own, to exist for itself. Such a sin requires no complex social conditions, no extended experience, no great intellectual development. From the moment a creature becomes aware of God as God, and of itself as self, the terrible alternative of choosing God or self for the center is open to it. This sin is committed daily by young children and ignorant peasants, as well as by sophisticated persons, by solitaries no less than by those who live in society. It is the fall in every individual life, and in each day of each individual life, the basic sin behind all particular sins. At this very moment, you and I are either committing it, or about to commit it, or repenting it. We try, when we wake, to lay the new day at God's feet. Before we have finished shaving, it becomes our day, and God's share in it is felt as a tribute which we must pay out of our own pocket, a deduction from the time which ought, we feel, to be our own. A man starts a new job with a sense of vocation, and, perhaps for the first week, still keeps the discharge of the vocation as his end, taking the pleasures and pains from God's hand as they come as accidents. But in the second week, he is beginning to know the ropes. By the third, he has quarried out of the total job his own plan for himself within that job, and when he can pursue this, he feels that he is getting no more than his rights, and when he cannot, that he is being interfered with. A lover, in obedience to a quite uncalculating impulse, which may be full of good will as well as of desire and need, not be, and desire and need not be forgetful of God, embraces his beloved, and then quite innocently experiences a thrill of sexual pleasure. But the second embrace may have that pleasure in view, may be a means to an end, may be the first downward step toward the state of regarding a fellow creature as a thing as a machine to be used for his pleasure. Thus the bloom of innocence, the element of obedience and the readiness to take what comes, is rubbed off every activity. Thoughts undertaken for God's sake, like that on which we are engaged at the moment, are continued as if they were an end in themselves, and then as if our pleasure in thinking were the end, and finally as if our pride or celebrity were the end. Thus, all day long and all the days of our life, we are sliding, slipping, falling away, as if God were, to our present consciousness, a smooth, inclined plane on which there is no resting. 
And indeed, we are now of such a nature that we must slip off, and the sin, because it is unavoidable, may be venial. But God cannot have made us so. The gravitation away from God, the journey homeward to a habitual self, must, we think, be a product of the fall. What exactly happened when men fell, we do not know. But if it is legitimate to guess, I offer the following picture, a myth in the Socratic sense, a not unlikely tale. Footnote. I.e., an account of what may have been the historical fact, not to be confused with myth in Dr. Niebuhr's sense, i.e., a symbolical representation of non historical truth. End footnote. For long centuries, God perfected the animal form which was to become the vehicle of humanity and the image of himself. He gave it hands whose thumb could be applied to each of the fingers, and jaws and teeth and throat capable of articulation, and a brain sufficiently complex to execute all the material motions whereby rational thought is incarnated. The creature may have existed for ages in this state before it became man, it may even have been clever enough to make things which a modern archaeologist would accept as proof of its humanity. But it was only an animal because all its physical and psychical processes were directed to purely material and natural ends. Then, in the fullness of time, God caused to descend upon this organism, both on its psychology and physiology, a new kind of consciousness, which could say I and me, which could look upon itself as an object, which knew God, which could make judgments of truth, beauty, and goodness, and which was so far above time that it could perceive time flowing past. This new consciousness ruled and illuminated the whole organism, flooding every part of it with light, and was not, like ours, limited to a selection of the movements going on in one part of the organism, namely the brain. Man was then all consciousness. The modern yogi claims, whether falsely or truly, to have under control those functions which to us are almost part of the external world, such as digestion and circulation. This power the first man had in eminence. His organic processes obeyed the law of his own will, not the law of nature. His organs sent up appetites to the judgment seat of will, not because they had to, but because he chose. Sleep meant to him not the stupor which we undergo, but willed and conscious repose. He remained awake to enjoy the pleasure and duty of sleep. Since the processes of decay and repair in his tissues were similarly conscious and obedient, it may not be fanciful to suppose that the length of his life was largely at his own discretion wholly commanding himself. He commanded all lower lives with which he came into contact. Even now we meet rare individuals who have a mysterious power of taming beasts. This power, the paradisal man enjoyed in eminence. The old picture of the brutes sporting before Adam and fawning upon him may not be wholly symbolical. Even now, more animals than you might expect are ready to adore man if they are given a reasonable opportunity. For man was made to be the priest, and even, in one sense, the Christ of the animals, the mediator through whom they apprehend so much of the divine splendor as their irrational nature allows. And God was, to such a man, no slippery, inclined plane. The new consciousness had been made to repose on its creator, and repose it did. However rich and varied man's experience of his fellows or fellow in charity and friendship and sexual love, or of the beasts, or of the surrounding world, then first recognized as beautiful and awful, God came first in his love and in his thought, and that without painful effort. In perfect cyclic movement, being, power, and joy descended from God to man in the form of gift, and returned from man to God in the form of obedient love and ecstatic adoration. And in this sense, though not in all, man was then truly the Son of God, the prototype of Christ, 
perfectly enacting in joy and ease of all the faculties and all the senses that filial self-surrender which our Lord enacted in the agonies of the crucifixion. Judged by his artifacts, or perhaps even by his language, this blessed creature was, no doubt, a savage. All that experience and practice can teach, he had still to learn. If he chipped flints, he doubtless chipped them clumsily enough. He may have been utterly incapable of expressing, in conceptual form, his paradisal experience. All that is quite irrelevant. From our own childhood, we remember that, before our elders thought us capable of understanding anything, we already had spiritual experience, as pure and as momentous as any we have undergone since, though not, of course, as rich in factual context. From Christianity itself, we learn that there is a level, in the long run the only level of importance, on which the learned and the adult have no advantage at all over the simple and the child. I do not doubt that if the paradisal man could now appear among us, we should regard him as an utter savage, a creature to be exploited, or at best patronized. Only one or two, and those the holiest among us, would glance a second time at the naked, shaggy-bearded, slow-spoken creature. But they, after a few minutes, would fall at his feet. We do not know how many of these creatures God made, nor how long they continued in the paradisal state. But sooner or later they fell. Someone or something whispered that they could become as gods, that they could cease directing their lives to their creator and taking all their delights as uncovenanted mercies, as accidents in the logical sense, which arose in the course of a life directed not to those delights, but to the adoration of God. As a young man wants a regular allowance from his father, which he can count on as his own, within which he makes his own plans, and rightly, for his father is, after all, a fellow creature, so they desire to be on their own, to take care for their own future, to plan for pleasure and for security, to have a meum from which, no doubt, they would pay some reasonable tribute to God in the way of time, attention, and love, but which, nevertheless, was theirs, not his. They wanted, as we say, to call their souls their own. But that means to live a lie, for our souls are not, in fact, our own. They wanted some corner in the universe of which they could say to God, This is our business, not yours. But there is no such corner. They wanted to be nouns, but they were, and eternally must be, mere adjectives. We have no idea in what particular act or series of acts the self-contradictory, impossible wish found expression. For all I can see, it might have concerned the literal eating of a fruit. But the question is of no consequence. This act of self-will on the part of the creature, which constitutes an utter falseness to its true creaturely position, is the only sin that can be conceived as the fall for the difficulty about the first sin is that it must be very heinous, or its consequences would not be so terrible, and yet it must be something which a, free be which a being free from the temptations of fallen man could conceivably have committed. The turning from God to self fulfills both conditions. It is a sin possible even to paradisal man, because the mere existence of a self, the mere fact that we call it me, includes from the first the danger of self-idolatry. Since I am I, I must make an act of self-surrender, however small or however easy, in living to God rather than to myself. This is, if you like, the weak spot in the very nature of creation, the risk which God apparently thinks worth taking. But the sin was very heinous, because the self which paradisal man had to surrender contained no natural recalcitrancy to being surrendered. His data, so to speak, were a, psycho, were a psychophysical organism wholly subject to the will, and a will wholly disposed, though not compelled, to turn to God. The self-surrender which he practiced before the fall meant no struggle, 
but only the delicious overcoming of an infinitesimal self-adherence, which delighted to be overcome, of which we see a dim analogy in the rapturous mutual self-surrenders of lovers even now. He had, therefore, no temptation, in our sense, to choose the self, no passion or inclination obstinately inclining that way, nothing but the, but the bare fact that the self was himself. Up to that moment, the human spirit had been in full control of the human organism. It doubtless expected that it would retain this control when it had ceased to obey God. But its authority over the organism was a delegated authority which it lost when it ceased to be God's delegate. Having cut itself off, as far as it could, from the source of its being, it had cut itself off from the source of power. For when we say of created things that A rules B, this must mean that God rules B through A. I doubt whether it would have been intrinsically possible for God to continue to rule the organism through the human spirit when the human spirit was in revolt against him. At any rate, he did not. He began to rule the organism in a more external way, not by the laws of the spirit, but by those of nature. Footnote. This is a development of Hooker's conception of law. To disobey your proper law, i.e. the law God makes for a being such as you, means to find yourself obeying one of God's lower laws, e.g. If, when walking on a slippery pavement, you neglect the law of prudence, you suddenly find yourself obeying the law of gravitation. End footnote. Thus the organs, no longer governed by man's will, fell under the control of ordinary biochemical laws and suffered whatever the interworkings of those laws might bring about in the way of pain, senility, and death. And desires began to come up into the mind of man, not as his reason chose, but just as the biochemical and environmental facts happened to cause them. And the mind itself fell under the psychological laws of association and the like, which God had made to rule the psychology of the higher anthropo anthropoids. And the will, caught in the tidal wave of mere nature, had no resource but to force back some of the new thoughts and desires by main strength, and these uneasy rebels became the subconscious as we now know it. The process was not, I conceive, comparable to mere deterioration as it may now occur in a human individual. It was a loss of status as a species. What man lost by the fall was his original specific nature. Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. The total organism, which had been taken up into his spiritual life, was allowed to fall back into the merely natural condition from which, at his making, it had been raised, just as, far earlier in the story of creation, God had raised vegetable life to become the vehicle of animality, and chemical process to be the vehicle of vegetation, and physical process to be the vehicle of chemical. Thus, human spirit from being the master of human nature, became a mere lodger in its own house, or even a prisoner. Rational consciousness became what it, is, what it now is, a fitful spotlight resting on a small part of the cerebral motions. But this limitation of the spirit's power was a lesser evil than the corruption of the spirit itself. It had turned from God and become its own idol, so that though it could still turn back to God, footnote, theologians will note that I am not here intending to make any contribution to the Pelagian-Augustinian controversy. I mean only that such return to God was not, even now, an impossibility. Where the initiative lies in any instance of such return is a question on which I am saying nothing. End footnote. So, backing up a bit. It had turned from God and become its own idol, so that though it could, turn, it could still turn back to God, it could do so only by painful effort, and its inclination was self-word, hence pride and ambition, the desire to be lovely in its own eyes and to depress and humiliate all rivals, envy and restless search for more and still more, 
security, were now the attitudes that came easiest to it. It was not only a weak king over its own nature, but a bad one. It sent down into the, into the psychophysical organism desires far worse than the organism sent up into it. This condition was transmitted by heredity to all later generations, for it was not simply what biologists call an acquired variation. It was the emergence of a new kind of man. A new species, never made by God, had sinned itself into existence. The change which man had undergone was not parallel to the development of a new habit. It was a radical alteration of his constitution, a disturbance of the relation between his component parts and an internal perversion of one of them. God might have arrested this process by miracle, but this, to speak in somewhat irreverent metaphor, would have been to decline the problem which God had set himself when he created the world, the problem of expressing his goodness through the total drama of a world containing free agents in spite of and by means of their rebellion against him. The symbol of a drama, a symphony, or a dance is here useful to correct a certain absurdity which may arise if we talk too much of God planning and creating the world process for good and of that good being frustrated by the free will of the creatures. This may raise the ridiculous idea that the fall took God by surprise and upset his plan, or else more ridiculously still, that God planned the whole thing for conditions which, he well knew, were never going to be realized. In fact, of course, God saw the crucifixion in the act of creating the first nebula. The world is a dance in which good, descending from God, is disturbed by evil arising from the creatures, and the resulting conflict is resolved by God's own assumption of the suffering nature which evil produces. The doctrine of the free fall the doctrine of the free fall asserts that the evil which thus makes the fuel or raw material for the second and more complex kind of good is not God's contribution but man's. This does not mean that if man had remained innocent, God could not then have contrived an equally splendid symphonic whole, supposing that we insist on asking such questions. But it must always be remembered that when we talk of what might have happened, of contingencies outside the whole actuality, we do not really know what we are talking about. There are no times or places outside the existing universe in which all this could happen or could have happened. I think the most significant way of stating the real freedom of man is to say that if there are other rational species than man, existing in some other part of the actual universe, then it is not necessary to suppose that they also have fallen. Our present condition, then, is explained by the fact that we are members of a spoiled species. I do not mean that our sufferings are a punishment for being what we cannot now help being, nor that we are morally responsible for the rebellion of a remote ancestor. If, nonetheless, I call our present condition one of original sin, and not merely one of original misfortune, that is because our actual religious experience does not allow us to regard it in any other way. Theoretically, I suppose we might say, yes, we behave like vermin, but then that is because we are vermin, and that, at any rate, is not our fault. But the fact that we are vermin so far from being felt as an excuse, is a greater shame and grief to us than any of the particular acts which it leads us to commit. The situation is not nearly so hard to understand as some people make out. It arises among human beings whenever a very badly brought up boy is introduced into a decent family. They rightly remind themselves that it is not his own fault that he is a bully, a coward, a talebearer, and a liar, but nonetheless, however it came there, his present character is detestable. They not only hate it, but ought to hate it. They cannot love him for what he is. They can only try to turn him into what he is not. In the meantime, though the boy is most unfortunate in having been so brought up, 
you cannot quite call his character a misfortune, as if he were one thing and his character another. It is he, he himself, who bullies and sneaks and likes doing it. And if he begins to mend, he will inevitably feel shame and guilt at what he is just beginning to cease to be. With this, I have said all that can be said on the level at which alone I feel able to treat the subject of the fall. But I warn my readers once more that this level is a shallow one. We have said nothing about the trees of life and of knowledge, which doubtless conceal some great mystery. And we have said nothing about the Pauline statement that, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. It is this passage which lies behind the patristic doctrine of our physical presence in Adam's loins, and Anselm's doctrine of our inclusion by legal fiction in the suffering of Christ. These theories may have done good in their day, but they do no good to me, and I am not going to invent others. We have recently been told by the scientists that we have no right to expect that the real universe should be picturable, and that if we make mental pictures to illustrate quantum physics, we are moving further away from reality, not nearer to it. We have clearly even less right to demand that the highest spiritual realities should be picturable, or even explicable in terms of our abstract thought. I observe that the difficulty of the Pauline formula turns on the word in, and that this word, again and again in the New Testament, is used in sentences we cannot fully understand. That we can die in Adam and live in Christ seems to me to imply that man, as he really is, differs a good deal from man as our categories of thought and our three-dimensional imaginations represent him. That the separateness, modified only by causal relations, which we discern between individuals, is balanced in absolute reality by some kind of inter-inanimation of which we have no conception at all. It may be that the acts and sufferings of great archetypal individuals, such as Adam and Christ, are ours, not by legal fiction, metaphor, or causality, but in some much deeper fashion. There is no question, of course, of individuals melting down into a kind of spiritual continuum, such as pantheistic systems believe in. That is excluded by the whole tenor of our faith but there may be a tension between individuality and some other principle. We believe that the Holy Spirit can be really present and operative in the human spirit, but we do not, like pantheists, take this to mean that we are parts or modifications or appearances of God. We may have to suppose, in the long run, that something of the same kind is true in its appropriate degree, even of created spirits that each, though distinct, is really present in all or in some, others, just as we may have to admit action at a distance into our conception of matter. Everyone will have noticed how the Old Testament seems at times to ignore our conception of the individual. When God promises Jacob that he will go down with him into Egypt and will also surely bring him up again, this is fulfilled either by the burial of Jacob's body in Palestine or by the exodus of Jacob's descendants from Egypt. It is quite right to connect this notion with the social structure of early communities in which the individual is constantly overlooked in favor of the tribe or family, but we ought to express this connection by two propositions of equal importance. Firstly, that their social experience blinded the ancients to some truths which we perceive, and secondly, that it made them sensible of some truths to which we are blind. Legal fiction, adoption, and transference, or imputation of merit and guilt, could never have played the part they did play in theology if they had always been felt to be so artificial as we now feel them to be. I have thought it right to allow this one glance at what is, for me, an impenetrable curtain, but as I have said, it makes no part of my present argument. Clearly, it would be futile to attempt to solve the problem of pain by producing another problem. The thesis of this chapter is simply that man, as a species, 
spoiled himself, and that good and that good to us in our present state must therefore mean primarily remedial or corrective good. What part pain actually plays in such remedy or correction is now to be considered.